Do you know that the origins of Mother's Day in the United States actually date back to the 19th century? Uh, In the years before the Civil War, a woman named Ann Reeves Jarvis of West Virginia helped start Mother's Day work clubs to teach local women how to properly care for their children. And these clubs later became a unifying force in a region of the country divided over the Civil War. So in 1868, Jarvis organized Mother's Friendship Day at which mothers gathered with former Union and Confederate soldiers to promote reconciliation. Another precursor to Mother's Day came from abolitionist, suffragette, and poet Julia Ward Howe. Some of us know that name because she wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic in 1861. Well, in 1870, Howe wrote the Mother's Day Proclamation, a call to action that asked mothers to unite in promoting world peace. In 1873, Howe campaigned for a Mother's Peace Day to be celebrated every June 2nd. That didn't happen, but maybe it should. Mother's Day was observed in Ann Jarvis Methodist Church in West Virginia and quickly spread more broadly and focused on properly caring for babies, ensuring sanitation, building hospitals, and peace work. The desire to nurture, to provide care, and encourage growth is something that we encourage and value in so many mothers. And not just human mothers. We see it in so many of God's creatures. Just this past week, the uh, Cape Cotter had an article about helping to prevent wildlife orphans, and in it, it stated emphatically, squirrels are attentive mothers, just in case you didn't know. Well, I'm obviously very blessed to be married to Jill, who is a wonderful mother to our sons, and I'm thankful that I had a very good relationship with my mother as well. And I know that this isn't the case for everyone, and I'm sorry about that. And I pray for those for whom that relationship needs grace and mercy and forgiveness and healing. My mother died in 2009, and I still think of her. And one of the things I loved about my mother was her laugh and her sense of humor. My mother laughed easily and frequently, and she had a wonderful smile, as you can see. She had a quote on her refrigerator that said, a smile is a light in the window of the soul indicating that the heart is at home. I like that. I was always happy to preach at a worship service when my mother was present because I knew if I said anything funny, I would hear her laugh. Now, laughter isn't the first thing that some people associate with worship in church. But one of the things we see when we read the Bible is that sometimes People are silent before God in worship. And other times, they're praising God with every instrument they can possibly get their hands on. Sometimes, that's all right. Sometimes, people are lamenting and crying out to God in their pain, their heartache, their brokenness, and their suffering. But other times, gladness, joy, and thanksgiving are the primary emotions people are expressing as they come to worship and to pray. And this teaches you that you can bring all of your emotions to God, including gladness and laughter. Now, some of us are old enough to remember a movie called Pollyanna. And in that film, Haley Mills plays the title character, as you can see, and Carl Malden is the pastor, and earlier in the movie than this scene, we experience him preaching in a way that is very harsh, very angry. It's hard to listen to. Frankly, I wouldn't have been going to that church. And so in this chat, she mentions to him the glad passages, the happy ones, sharing that her father had researched and discovered 800 rejoicing texts that are all mentioned in the Bible. And Pollyanna says to him, if God took the trouble to tell us 800 times to be glad and rejoice, he must want us to do it some. And I agree with her. And one of the attributes of God that we see in Psalm 86 is that God gladdens our soul. 
God gladdens our soul, which is what the psalmist is asking God to do once again. So listen to Psalm 86. We're going to begin with the verses we shared last week and take it into verse 4. Because again, this prayer is coming from a place of need. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me. O Lord, for to you I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Pollyanna is correct that there are a lot of passages in the Bible that speak about being glad and rejoicing. One is Psalm 100, very familiar psalm for some of us. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Now let me explain to you in Hebrew what that means. It means we are to worship the Lord with gladness. That's, that's all. That's all there really is to it. And, you know, I'm grateful that there are a fair amount of people who would say, who are connected to our church, what Psalm 122 verse 1 says, which is, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Would people observing you coming into worship today, would they say you were glad? Well, fortunately, we have cameras, security cameras outside, and we took video of all of you coming into the church today who are physically in the building. Those watching online escape this. So we have some shots to see who looks the gladdest and the happiest coming in and who maybe doesn't. Let's take a look. Actually, we didn't do that. <laughs> but if you got really nervous when I said we did... Maybe you need to think about coming to God's house with gladness a little bit more. Just a thought. Now, for those of you who are watching online, I hope some of you do come with a sense of anticipation, hope, and gladness. Because I have encountered in people, and maybe you have in some people, this belief that it's almost like the more serious and the sadder you look, the holier you are. Now, I'm not saying that we deny the hurt, the pain, the hardship, the heartache in our life when we worship God. Every person here, every person watching is carrying a burden you don't know about. Every single one. And there's great suffering and injustice and pain in the world enough that you can easily feel depressed or even hopeless. We're not denying the reality of life. However, part of what helps you get through all of that is the ability we have to lift our soul up to God. To come before God in worship and for God to gladden our soul. It pleases God when you take delight in the Lord. And worshiping the Lord with gladness presupposes a relationship that makes you want to be there. And taking time to lift your soul to God in prayer reminds you of some really important things. That there is a God who loves you. There is a God who thinks you're precious and wants you to see everyone else that way too. There is a God who wants what's best for you. There is a God who wants to push you to grow and who blesses you every single day if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. You know, there are many reasons why millions of people, especially younger people, want nothing to do with the church of Jesus Christ in the United States. And one of the reasons is because many people who claim to be Christians don't seem to be glad or happy at all. They appear angry, mad, judgmental, self-righteous, arrogant, uncaring, snide, condescending. These are some of the words that non-Christians use to describe Christians. 
What they don't find are people who are glad, loving, and kind. I mean, sometimes I just want to say, you know, it's not that hard. Just be kind to people. But some of these folks who are not doing a great job for us as Christians, they find little to celebrate about life in this world, and then they're surprised that nobody wants to join them. And this is very different than the perspective of Psalm 92 that Shelby began the service for us with. Psalm 92, for you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, by all that you have made. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. I mean, if you can't find reasons to be glad in the beginning of May, in the northern hemisphere, with the leaves coming out, green flooding our vision everywhere we look, the tulips and the daffodils in bloom, the cherry trees bursting forth, the days getting longer and warmer. If you can't find any reason to be glad right now, I don't know what to say to you. And yet Psalm 4 expresses that there is a gladness to be found in a relationship with God that's even beyond the gladness that comes with the abundant food and drink that God provides through the bounty of creation. Psalm 4 verse 7 says, you have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and new wine abound. My mother liked a lot of Bible verses, and one of her favorites was Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. As Christians, we worship a God who gladdens our soul. And while we all have different temperaments, we all have different personalities, I understand that. And while we recognize the suffering and the pain in the world, it's still true. We can choose every day. What am I going to focus on? I can choose, you can choose to be a person of joy and gladness. Look for reasons to be glad, to be grateful, to be appreciative, to be thankful every day. And even with the challenges that you're facing in your life, I promise you, you will find those reasons to be glad and to be grateful and thankful. And it'll start to change your attitude and your perspective. In the 15th, 16th, and 17th chapters of the Gospel of John, that includes Jesus' final major speech to his disciples and perhaps his most important prayer. And these are the words of a teacher to his students on the night before his violent, painful death. And these aren't words spoken like a master to a servant, but they're from one friend sharing with another friend. They are the words of someone who is going to die, speaking to those he loves. What would you say in a situation like that? We could say a lot of different things. You might speak of the un injustice and the unfairness of it all and feel sorry for yourself. You could speak angrily of revenge. You could lament your unfortunate condition before God and everyone within earshot to gain sympathy. You know, some of us, you know, we've got to be careful. We don't walk around life with a violin case, right? You know, Oh, my goodness. You might in that situation seek to speak words of assurance and comfort of appreciation and hope. What might come as somewhat of a surprise in that context with what Jesus was facing, we might not expect to hear words of joy. And yet Jesus speaks of joy, not once, not twice, but three times in those chapters. Three times he speaks, not of an occasional burst of happiness, but of complete joy. This is what Jesus says in John 15, verse 11, chapter 16, verses 22 to 24, and John 17, verse 13. He says, I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you, so that your joy may be complete. So you have pain now. And some of us say, yeah, I do. So you have pain now, but I will see you again. 
and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. But now I am coming to you, Jesus says to the Father, and I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. Does that seem like a pattern to anybody else or is it just me? Jesus wants us to have the complete joy that comes from a transforming relationship with the loving and gracious God who has given all of us our life. And as we're united with Jesus through prayer, through his word, and through loving obedience, the result in our lives will be joy. That's why some of us learned when we were little, little kids, right? If you've got the joy of Jesus down in your heart, we learned a little song about that, right? Well, it should show on your face, right? Dennis Prager in his book, Happiness is a Serious Problem, shares this experience. He said, I once asked a deeply religious man if he considered himself a truly pious person. And he responded that while he aspired to be one, he felt that he fell short in two categories. One of those areas, he said, was his not being a happy enough person to be considered truly pious. And his point was that unhappy religious people reflect poorly on their religion and on their creator. He was right. In fact, unhappy religious people pose a real challenge to faith. If their faith is so impressive, why aren't these devoted adherents happy? Well, there are only two possible reasons. Either they're not practicing their faith correctly, or they are practicing their faith correctly, and their religion itself is not conducive to happiness. And Prager writes, most outsiders assume the latter reason. Unhappy religious people should therefore think about how important being happy is, if not for themselves, then for the sake of their religion. Now listen to this. This is what he concludes. He says, unhappy, let alone angry religious people, provide more persuasive arguments for atheism and secularism than do all the arguments of the atheists. Wow. And now, I know joy and happiness are not exactly the same thing, but following Jesus is conducive to joy. And I hope I'm not the only person who would affirm that and state that. So if you practice the faith of Jesus correctly, the fruit of joy will begin to grow and become increasingly evident in your life over time. If you have the joy of Jesus in your life, again, through hearing his word, through prayer, through loving obedience, you'll be better able to face even the most challenging seasons in your life. You know, if we hope to share the good news of God's love with other people, we should remember that as Christians, if we go around every day looking like we've been sucking on lemons all day long, we aren't likely to convince people how wonderful it is to be a follower of Christ. There's an old gospel song, and I don't know that many of you know it, but I'm not making this up. There's an old gospel song, If You're Happy, Notify Your Face. I don't know if you know it. I almost played it on my cell phone for you. I've got it here by a group called the LaFays. If you're happy, notify your face. Take that frown off and put a smile in its place. If you love Jesus, well, show it to the human race. If you're happy, notify your face. We go to many meetings, see Christians everywhere. We sing and talk of Jesus and how it'll be up there. We talk of all the burdens confronting the human race and say our Jesus is the answer with a frown all over our face. We claim we've got the answer to everything that's wrong. Then sit in church impatiently when services get long. Then we go out in the world with faces sad and mean. And it's no wonder folks won't listen that Jesus is supreme. So if you're happy, 
Notify your face. Now, I don't say this, I want to be really clear, to put a load of guilt on anybody, especially on those of you who may be coping with the loss of a loved one right now, who may be going through a very difficult personal season. However, the truth remains, and it's good news, that Jesus radiated joy, and he wants his joy to be in you. And he wants your joy to be full and complete. Isn't that a wonderful gift to want to give to us? You know, it's part of what made Jesus attractive to all kinds of people. Children and adults, the troubled, the grieving, tax collectors, people from all walks of life coping with all kinds of stuff. Everyone was attracted to Jesus. It says they heard him gladly. And one of the reasons why is because he radiated joy. The only people who didn't like Jesus were religious people. Because they thought he hung around with the wrong crowd, went to too many parties, and gave God a bad name. Jesus, the one who was without sin, had a personality overflowing with gladness. And I know this may be little consolation. But we should remember, even with all of that, Jesus wasn't spared suffering or even the cross. Just as some of our loved ones and some of us are not spared other circumstances that we wish we were. And it's appropriate to pray for healing and to pray for help, to pray for deliverance. But it's also important to pray for the heart, mind, and joy of Jesus in your circumstances whatever those circumstances may be. Paul says that the second fruit of the Spirit is joy. And his letter to the Philippians is known for its emphasis on joy. And he wrote it from prison to a church that was experiencing conflict and division. And what does he say? Rejoice in the Lord always. Even now, again I will say, rejoice. 1 Chronicles 16, 27 describes what it's like in the presence of God, and it says, splendor and majesty are before him, strength and joy in his dwelling place. Psalm 16, verse 11 declares, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and none other than Martin Luther said, if you're not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there. Amen to that. The team's going to come back up, lead us in Psalm 139. I'll pray as they come. God, we thank you that you are a God of joy, a God of laughter, a God of gladness. And I pray, God, for all of us, even if we're hurting today as the psalmist is in writing this psalm. God, we pray that you would renew our spirits that you would gladden our souls as we take this time and worship before you. We pray that we would feel a greater sense of your spirit and your joy and your gladness when we leave this time of worship than we had when we arrived. And may we know that we've been in your presence by that joy within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.